So we're uh, looking at maybe the most famous theologic attack on belief in God, sometimes called the argument from evil, the argument from observation of evil or suffering or imperfection in our world, to the conclusion that there is no God or no good God who's overseen all this. In a way, it's the uh, inverse or the opposite of some kind of the argument from design. In the argument from design, we observe in our environment, in the universe, a certain degree of order. Even remember that Quranic verse, which talked about the earth being made for you, that your environment seems to be benignly uh, arranged for your own benefit. From that environment, you would infer a powerful being who's also quite good, who cares for you. In the problem of evil, you observe the world and find it to be so imperfect or find it to be so full of suffering um, that you infer um, that there there's no good deity who's overseen this. Typically, you go to the conclusion that there's there's no God. I guess there's a, there's a version imaginable of the problem of evil where you find the environment to be so awful, you infer an evil uh, demonic creator or uh, overseer. Two versions of the argument. We're going to focus on the first, the deductive or logical problem of evil. That's the one that uh, Mackey um, famously uh, defends in his, his uh, journal article from around 1950. And there's also the inductive or probabilistic or evidential Problem of evil, argument from evil. Uh, William Rowe is maybe associated with that in recent decades. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that second one quite briefly, but we'll, we'll spend most of our time here today going through Mackey's presentation of the deductive problem of evil. He defends it, that is, he's an advocate of this argument, which takes us to atheism in his view, or something like atheism. Okay, so we have an inconsistent set of theistic beliefs. God is good. This is this. These are beliefs that every Jew, Christian, and Muslim, to start with, would would agree to. God is good. God is omnipotent. Can do anything. And evil exists. Now, that's not an attribute of God. That's something we observe in our world around us. And <clears throat> I don't want to get too sidetracked into a very kind of high-level philosophical discussion of what we mean by evil. Uh, certainly, if you spend your life looking at this problem, you'll want to spend a, a decade or two <laughs> trying to define evil carefully. But I, I think for our purposes, we can... The argument's meant to be a little more rough and ready than that. Evil is just bad, bad stuff, bad stuff that happens. And I don't think there's any debate that bad stuff happens. I mean, even if you, even if you think, well, it's just bad for the person it's happening to. Okay, what's well, bad for the person? That's a kind of bad. It's not bad simpliciter, bad universally, but it's bad for that person. And, um, that might be enough to, to at least get us going here in the argument. I mean, we can come back and return to this third proposition. And as, as Mackey does, Mackey, Mackey says there are ways of doubting um, three. So those are three propositions that every believer in God would accept. And Mackey says, if you consider those three propositions together with these two quasi-logical rules, you see that there is an inconsistency or a self-contradiction in theism, theism being the systematic belief in God. By quasi-logical, I think Mackey just means these are pretty much definitions of the key term in each. So number one is a statement about omnipotence. It's really just telling us 
by definition, there would be no limits to what an omnipotent being could do. And number two is telling us something about just the definition of good. Good opposes evil and seeks to eliminate it. It might not be um, the focus of good. good. Good's first motivation might be to just spread good and to be good. And so if only by a byproduct of that spreading of the good, uh, it would it would eliminate evil or dilute evil. But I think true goodness, real goodness, real robust goodness would, if confronted with evil, oppose it and seek to eliminate it. Eliminate it can mean not just uh, murder it, but transform it. I mean, maybe transform it with the power of love what what whatever but it would seek to uh, rid the world of evil that's uh, that's why the hero is good the hero in our stories and life is is just goodness in action so Mackie says if you if you accept these two quasi logical rules and you're also a believer in god you believe that uh, God is good and uh, God is omnipotent and evil exists. You've got a problem logically because rule one tells us God can do anything and rule two tells us God being good would want to eliminate evil in our world. Yet proposition three from our last set tells us that evil exists. So something's got to give these five statements the three theistic statements from the last slide and these two rules they can't all be true <clears throat> so the genuine solutions to this problem of evil it's a problem for a believer in god and it's a logical problem the genuine solutions Mackie says uh, maybe with some Irony and uh, poison in his pen says the genuine solutions are to drop one of those uh, one of those propositions. I mean, if you really want to quote unquote solve the problem, you got to give up belief in a good God or an all powerful God, or maybe you want to leave Western theism altogether and entertain the possibility that good, uh, evil, and maybe goodness too are all an illusion. And so drop the view that evil exists. But if you really think that evil is an illusion, then that wouldn't that give you carte blanche to do whatever you wanted? I mean, you could just go on a rampage. And when confronted by a moral authority or by your victim and their complaint, you can just say, well, it's okay. It's all good. It's all good, bro. Evil is all an illusion. I don't think many uh, believers in God would be very happy with that solution. <laughs> and and I don't think we would like it if at the end of history we, we were given our audience with this God who made our world and oversaw it. And we said, why did you allow all these terrible things to happen? I mean, seemingly countless instances of pointless, extreme suffering. And if this God's answer was, hey, it's evil's all an illusion, it's it's okay. It's all it was all a dream and you've woken up now. I don't know, maybe that'll feel all right at that point, but uh I think a lot of us would feel well, the dream was real when you were in it. What what is real? Real is the experience <laughs> of a world and our suffering in it was real the suffering was was not fake we felt it and suffering is as real as it feels it's an intrinsically subjective phenomenon in any case the genuine solutions involve dropping one of those five propositions and i don't think many believers in god who believe god is truly good and do believe there i mean i think christians and muslims and jews uh, really do believe that there is evil in the world and a lot of terrible things happen. I mean, a lot of the prophetic works in the Bible are the prophets 
giving voice to Yahweh's rage at the evil taking place in the world. I mean, in the in the Old Testament, especially Yahweh, God seems to be very bothered by the evil in the world and takes it to be real, and um, at least once just wipes the world clean to start again because of its evil. That's a great flood. Okay, so you could also drop the idea that God is good. You could say, well, I guess there's a lot of evil in the world because this God is not good in our sense. Uh, this God is very powerful. This God is a super nerd creator who created this very cool what's for it, a kind of virtual reality or simulation or little ant farm. And he's a little bit like a laboratory scientist maybe observing his test subjects where the rats or the rabbits and he's very interested to see what happens and what we do and um, he manipulates our world to elicit reactions from us and he takes notes and he's maybe he goes home to his family at the end of the day and he's a decent man but for his test subjects he's the overseer of a hell so God's very powerful. He's this very, very powerful uh, super scientist. He or she or it, what? Maybe it's an AI entity. But not good. Well, that solves the problem, but the cost is great, of course. That's why I put the question mark after genuine solutions. I mean, these solutions have the cost of either giving up the belief that there's evil or giving up a, a significant portion of your belief in God. If you say, I believe in God, but I don't believe God's good, I think a lot of believers in God say, well, that's not God. If, if, you're take, if you take the good out, that's no longer God. And it's not a linguistic coincidence, those two words, God and good, in English and probably German, are, uh, are so close, just a letter away. You could give up the view that God is omnipotent. Uh, I, I know a little bit about at least one... one uh, tradition which kind of adopts this view in this ancient Persian religion called Zoroastrianism. It seems, uh, from what I can tell, there are two deities, uh, one a deity of light, one a deity of, of darkness, and they, they, they have, uh, I mean, you can look this up and correct me if I'm wrong, it's just an example which I'm wielding here to the to purpose. Uh, they're equally powerful, and the universe is just their uh, arena of competition. And if that's Zoroastrianism, then there's no problem of evil logically for Zoroastrianism. The Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian says evil happens because of the deity of darkness. Evil is where the deity of darkness is winning that little battle, that little skirmish in the world. And good is where the power of light is, is winning. And the battle goes on, and maybe there's a wrap-up at the end. Maybe good prevails in the end. But for now, evil is explained in terms of the good power's limited power. That good power is not all-powerful. It's in competition with something that opposes its will and opposes its will sometimes quite successfully. So genuine solutions, not really. They come at a, they come at a big cost. Here are the fallacious solutions. And the, the majority of the uh, Mackey article, which is a very famous, famous article in academic philosophy, one of the most widely read uh, uh, journal publications of the 20th century in, in philosophy, and really kick-started the contemporary discussion of this uh, of this problem, it's a very old problem. Most of the articles spent on these fallacious solutions. I think Mackey's frustrated. I think over the years he's been talking to uh, campus ministers and theologians and people of faith over dinner table conversation and colleagues, and he's he's used to the, a series of responses to the problem of evil, which he feels believes argues are really inadequate to, to deal with the problem. He thinks many of these so-called solutions really just miss the point. So these are fallacious or ineffective attempted solutions to the problem of evil. 
fallacious solution one, evil is a counterpart to good. The idea being that um, evil is the shadow, good is the light, and you can't have light without shadow, or you can't have light plus world without shadow. And th there are a few reasons this doesn't work, according to Mackey. Uh, but um, first of all, if what we're saying here is that good needs something that contrasts it to be not just perceivable, but real, we really wouldn't need so much of it, right? I mean, if you really do need something other than the color red to notice the color red, well, you just need a splotch of green on the canvas then, some, some counterpoint, countertone to calibrate your vision by. And our world isn't that world. Our world is filled with terrible things, filled with suffering. So it's not that this God has just inserted a little bit of the opposite of good to help us appreciate good. Uh, moreover, you, you know, it doesn't seem true that you would need something the opposite of good to appreciate it. You might need in, in your imaginative capacities an, an appreciation of evil. That is, you should in your mind be able to Imagine a world where bad things happen, and then and then you can open your eyes and look around our world and say, well, thank God our world isn't that world. In other words, God could have made a world, a world that's completely good, but given its creatures the power to imagine a world that's not good, and then they would appreciate their fully good world. These Four fallacious solutions, they're quite similar to each other. Part of the trick for you is to see that they're similar. They're almost facets of the same response, uh, but to also appreciate their differences. Fallacious solution B, evil is required as a means to good. You need evil to get to good, that is, we need evil as some kind of cause whose effect will be good. Cause, effect, evil, good. Mackey um, maybe rightly dismisses this one pretty quickly. If we're talking about cause and effect, and you're saying that God can't get to the good effect without the evil cause, you're really actually denying God's omnipotence. The whole idea of omnipotence is you can jump to any effect without the cause. That's magic. Magic is um, um, circumventing or just um, um, flying free of all the normal chains of cause and effect that non-magical action requires. You know, in non-magical action, you gotta, um, you gotta do push-ups every day to get pectoral muscles. In magic, you snap your fingers and you've got um, beach-ready pectorals. Well, God's the magician. God should be able to snap God's fingers and create a world. I mean, that's how God, God snaps God's fingers and says, let there be light and there is light and there is world and there is promontory and there is the waters and there is life. That's what we expect of an omnipotent being. So you're not getting God off the hook with this causal so-called solution. You're you're actually um, constraining your worship to a very limited being. Fallacious solution C, this one's actually quite promising, and I think there's a reason Mackey spends some time on it. 
And I think, in fact, a lot of a lot of people today who look at this problem after Mackey would, I think, thank Mackey for clarifying the the debate and the various positions. But I think a lot of us today say, actually, fallacious solution C does work. It's not fallacious. Um, it works. But Mackey really digs in. He, he does a does a good job explicating the, the the solution and then and then criticizing it. We won't look at every um, every response Mackey gives, but um, it's important to see how this is distinct from the prior two. The idea here is that every every single instance of evil, every bad thing that happens, must be for some greater good. This would get God off the hook if every single bad thing that happens is required for some greater good and not. Here's the key distinction from solution B, not required as a cause, but logically required. That it is simply impossible, deeply, 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 logically impossible to have the good in question without the evil that precedes it or accompanies it or follows it. We're not talking about cause and effect here, so we don't need to talk about the uh, evil coming first and then the good happening. It, 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 it could come after, it could come with it, but in some way the evil is required for the good. And we can certainly imagine examples of this. Imagine examples of goods and evils that have this logical connection. So, take suffering and relief. Okay, suffering's a bad thing. Relief, a good thing. Notice that you can't have relief without suffering. Suffering would come first in this case, and the relief would come after. The relief is relief it just is relief of suffering. So it's 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 not just that It would be absurd to demand that God give us the enjoyment of relief, but demand that God not let in any suffering. God would say, quite rightly, look, if you want to have this experience, you have to have this experience. There's simply no way to have this. And I don't think God would need to say, sorry, I'm just not powerful enough to give you relief without suffering. God would say, it's just in the very nature of things. It's in the very nature of relief. That is relief from suffering, right? So, um, right. It would, it would be like asking God to make two plus three equal 65. You know, if you say to God, Oh God, you're so powerful. Well, I want you to make two plus three equals 65. God would say, I can't do that. And that's not a limitation of my power. That's just because my, my, what my power, my power is to know everything and to calculate anything. And what I calculate is the truth. <laughs> and you're asking me to calculate what's false. In a way, you're asking me to be incompetent or something. Anyway. I, this is just one example of a pairing of a good, you can call it a second order or second level good, meaning it operates on the first level. So the suffering is the prior first level thing, and then the second order good of relief operates on it or is derived from it. And we can have many examples of these first and second order, and we can get into third order too, if we really think it through as Mackey does. But this is another way of putting solution C, that first order evil is required for second order good. And actually, 
many of the things in, in experience which are really, really good, which are really worth, you know, writing epic poems about and making the central quest of your own life, like things like this make really make life worth living. They really do re re rely on evil. You can't have heroes without suffering. The hero is someone who op opposes suffering, opposes some kind of evil. But most evil is actually, like most villains are trying to spread suffering. <laughs> so villainy is, is a second order thing too, which operates on the, on the first level stuff. The villain tries to eliminate this or maximize its own happiness at the expense of other people's suffering, right? Anyway, things like heroism, things like learning too, this is a bit more subtle, but notice if you think ignorance is a bad thing, maybe not uh, evil, but it's, it's a limitation, it's an imperfection. And learning can't take place without ignorance. If, if, if you are omniscient, you can't learn. And so learning is the process of going from a state of ignorance to knowledge. And so learn, but learning itself is a good thing. Knowledge is a great thing. Sure. But learning the process itself is a good thing. It's a great thing. Maybe it's at least, it's at least as good as knowledge itself. And, uh, like this movement from imperfection to perfection, this movement from suffering to relief, this action of the hero, which transforms the world into a better place. These are all processes which rely on imperfection and can't occur without imperfection. And they're great things. These are great things. These are the, if you're a God, um, if you're a movie maker, if you're an epic song writer, uh, if you're a VR designer and you want to create an interesting song or movie or VR environment, you're going to want to populate the world with these kinds of things, or you're going to want to create an environment which allow for the possibility of these second order goods and maybe evils. Right. So that's what gets God off the hook. Now, Mackey doesn't, Mackey doesn't think so. And he's got a number of responses to this third so-called solution. For example, he thinks that when you let in second order goods, you also let in second order evils, right? There are bad things now possible in the world. Um, um, that is, if, if you're saying heroism is what solves suffering, logically, not just in practice, but logically, you've got to contend with villains. And the villain might actually be sort of third order. It might operate on the hero. The villain might eliminate the hero or seek to. And you've got this extra super bad thing. In the, I mean, suffering, the sensation of physical pain is a terrible thing. But worse than that is the moral degradation and maliciousness of a, of a true villain, a true villain who wants suffering to take place. So suffering's bad, but this agent in, a, in the world who wants suffering to spread, this is an, a new kind of bad thing and maybe an extra bad thing. And so this, this system of levels, maybe in, in, the, in the final picture, just allows in a greater variety of goods and evils. <laughs> and um, you don't really get a, a kind of final level where it's resolved and where you can say, ah, here's where good triumphs. But I think this is where, I mean, to, to push back at Mackie a bit, I, I just, I just feel from what I can see, this is where a believer in God can say, well, God's omnipotent and God will make sure that in the end, good triumphs. Like that's God's great plan or providence for the world that yeah, in God's world, in God's history, it wraps up with heroism victorious. 
that's how that's just how in fact it ends of course logically you can imagine a world in which there's just this never-ending interplay between good and evil and you get a more maybe zoroastrian picture but in fact if god ensures that heroism uh, is victorious then isn't that a solution to the problem of evil? <laughs> I guess we can't know here on the ground which world we're in. Are we in the world that's overseen by, by a God who will uh, make sure all is good in the end? That's where maybe faith comes in, where you just believe with a bit of unjustified confidence that we are in that world, or maybe you see signs of it and you have hope. But hope is a kind of faith. much discussed free will solution from what i can tell free will is just a good it's i mean d is really just fallacious solution d is a version of fallacious fallacious solution c where the greater good is free will the ability of creatures to do according to their will so god god wants a world with something more than robots biological robots in it. God wants a world with free agents who make significant choices on their own and direct their own path to some degree. That's just, you might think God, God's only going to expend creative energy for that kind of world. That's the only kind of world we're really worth making. And Mackey's got a few replies to this. One is capital D determinism. This is a traditional position on the free will question the determinist believes that there is no such thing as freedom that freedom is an illusion and in fact the idea of freedom is is um is a bit absurd doesn't make sense so i mean Mackey doesn't dwell on this that's truly a whole other paper or a whole other book or class but he just nods in the direction of determinism to remind the reader that well first of all we might calling on our philosophical resources, be very skeptical, this whole idea of free will. And, um, uh, but, but he doesn't spend much time on that. Uh, number two, this is really interesting, and this one might um, annoy you, but I want you to really think about this and see that Mackey's got a point here, as far as I can tell. God could have made a world consisting entirely of free creatures who never do evil. That is a, a world where all the free creatures in it always choose good and never do evil. They are free, but in fact, they never do evil. And you might say, well, if they never do evil, then they're, then they're just robots. But no, that's, that's not true. If what, if what you're doing there is thinking, well, oh, so are you telling me that before God created this world, this, this world we're imagining, before God created it, God considered all the possible worlds God could have created and selected that world in which God had foreseen right to the end of time that no creature in that world ever does evil, and then, and then enacted that world. You might think, well, that's, that's cheating. God has just constrained all those creatures by by that choice but that doesn't make sense if, if that's what you're thinking because whatever world god actualizes is a world that god knew completely about beforehand god is omniscient which means knowing everything which means knowing the future too so god will know the total future from beginning to end of time of every world that God creates before God creates it. There are really no surprises in the world for God. So it's true also of the world in which, like ours, it seems, in which free beings like humans sometimes do good and sometimes do evil. It's also true of that world that God knew ahead of time when when we would do evil and when we would do good and there are no surprises in our action so if the if the beings in the world they never do evil in is not truly free 
because God saw ahead of time they would never do evil, then you have to say the same about our world. In other words, you can't reject this possibility. Um, without a better reason than, than this appeal to God's omniscience. Uh, maybe we won't spend time on this paradox of omnipotence. Uh, but notice that in assigning freedom to God's creatures, God is limiting, maybe voluntarily, but limiting God's own power, right? When you truly give your children freedom, you are limiting by that act your own power. You're saying, I will not interfere. Even when I want to, I will not interfere now. This creates a kind of paradox of omnipotence. We've got an omnipotent being who is willingly constraining its own omnipotence. Is this sensible? Not just advisable, but sensible, logical. You know, we could we could talk more about the determinism position. Um, it, it's it's a it's a position you'll almost certainly encounter if you take intro to philosophy, which here at Ryerson is PHL 201 or CPHL 201. You might spend a week or two on the problem of free will, but uh, maybe maybe we won't dwell on it here. So that's Mackey's uh, laying out of the deductive problem of evil. He supports the problem. He thinks it is, is a insolvable problem for believers in God. And then there's also this inductive problem, um, which partly uh, gets some gas after Mackey. A lot of people read Mackey and then felt actually that third so-called fallacious solution is actually a pretty good solution, it actually does solve it. Some version of the greater goods defense or some version of the free will defense, which I think is already a version of the greater goods defense, um, solves the problem, the de deductive problem of evil. And then, well, then we can re regenerate the problem of evil in inductive terms or probabilistic terms or evidential terms. So here's, I think, the simplest way of setting up the probabilistic argument. If, this is premise one, right, P1, if there is gratuitous evil, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, there's no God. Okay. This is not probabilistic. This statement in and of itself is not probabilistic. There's no maybe or probably or could be here. It's just straight up. If there's gratuitous evil, there is no God. Here's where the probability enters in. In premise two, we make the observation that there's probably gratuitous evil. And if there's probably gratuitous evil, then um, there's probably no God. God is incompatible with gratuitous evil. Gratuitous just means extra. And extra here means, think of the greater goods defense. Extra means not required for any greater good. Okay. A gratuitous evil is an evil that is not for some greater good. So it's suffering that is never opposed by heroism. It's a suffering that never finds relief 
right? It's an ignorance that is never um, resolved into knowledge, and so on. Gratuitous evil is pointless suffering. Roe gives the example, and he, he, I think he takes it just to be ubiquitous in, in the natural world, of a fawn who's been badly burnt in a forest fire, one of these just, you know, heartless events of the natural world, maybe ecologically necessary or beneficial, uh, maybe apocalyptic, but um, this particular fawn is just badly burnt over its entire body, and it lays in agony for two or three days. It just, it just, it just, you know, life is persistent even when life is really over it continues and the blood pumps and the skin registers sensation and this fawn is not going to recover and there's nobody who wanders by or in 3,000 years digs up the skeleton of the fawn and forensically recreates what happens to it and learns some valuable lesson from it you know it's just it just dies alone in extended agony this is just an example of gratuitous evil and okay it may may be there's some good thing that evil is connected to and we just can't see it but but it seems likely our world is full of examples of gratuitous evil there's just so much that happens that seems disconnected from any kind of good this is the evidential argument right so if 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 you think it likely that we're in this kind of world full of gratuitous evil, or even just one example of it, I mean, notice, strictly speaking, if there's, if you could just find one example in the entire history of the universe of gr truly gratuitous evil, <laughs> let's say there is a God, and God just overlooked this one little bit of evil, just forgot to connect it to a redeeming greater good. Uh, you know, when God is on trial at the end of time, I guess you could say guilty. You could judge guilty. That is, I guess, God, you're not truly omniscient or omnipotent. You missed something or you forgot something or you're not truly good. You just didn't care enough about this one little thing. You're pretty good. You're really good. You're great. You're almost perfect, but you're not, strictly speaking, God as we defined it. So you just, you just need one example of gratuitous evil. So what are the odds? I mean, premise two, to be evaluated, the likelihood of it. We're talking about what, what's the likelihood there is a single example of gratuitous evil. Of course, the believer in God will say, it's to be expected that we lowly creatures who are made in God's image, maybe, but um, are very, very small and live in such great ignorance of the totality and the ends of the world. It's to be expected that we will perceive a lot of things we don't understand, including a lot of terrible things that happen whose good we cannot perceive. So the, the theist would actually predict that creatures would observe a lot of apparently gratuitous evil. So the fact that we see a lot of stuff that happens, which is bad and doesn't seem connected to any good, as far as we can see, that's totally expected according to the believer of God. It's, it's just hard. It's so, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's hard to see if this evidential problem really is much of a problem for the believer. It's, there's nothing surprising here for the believer in God. Um, I think it's just one of those things where if, if you're already coming to this observation of evil with kind of atheistic background, maybe with reasons independent of this evil discussion um, to disbelieve in God, then the, the, the seemingly pointless evil you observe in the world will just seem to, it'll start to confirm your belief that there's no God, right? The pointless evil you observe in the world will very nicely fit your picture of the world. 
which is a world not overseen by something good and powerful. On the other hand, if you come to your observation of the world with independent faith or independent reason to believe in a good God, again, you're going to see a lot of bad things that happen, but you'll believe that it's in God's hands, that that there's a good reason for everything that happens, and you understand that you will not understand a lot that you observe. So I don't know where the argument from evil goes forward from here. It seems to just kind of, it's, it's like so often philosophy takes, it's useful, it takes you to a point where the argument kind of dissolves into our presuppositions, right? Where we can each see what our presuppositions coming to the debate are. And that's a lot. If you can at least see that, then that's that's something gained. But um, anyway. Right, there's our definition of gratuitous evil, evil not required for a greater good. We covered that. I think we're done. Okay, so uh, the problem of evil is one way you can challenge theism. In that case here, showing there's this logical contradiction in theism, if you're taking the, the deductive route, Mackey's route, or you're showing a little more mildly that it's, it's likely there's no God. The uh, religious explanations of religion are the internal or orthodox explanations of religion. These are the explanations of the phenomenon of religion, the social, psychological, cultural, historical, whatever, phenomenon of religion through a religion's own tradition. So taking a specific tradition, um, uh, take Islam, according to any good Muslim, if the question is, how did Islam happen? Islam is the religion, and we're seeking an explanation of religion. The answer is, well, God made Islam happen. God infused divine information into the world through the mediation of the angel Gabriel and uh, his prophet Muhammad. And so Islam enters the world around 1300 years ago by God's communication down into the world. And, and you'll find this kind of structure is, is, at the, at the center of any religious explanation of religion. The Christian story will be quite similar, except instead of uh, Muhammad, of course, Jesus will be the focus of the mediation or the incarnation of God. Um, if you get into the um, less monotheistically focused traditions, I don't want to say Hinduism is polytheistic. That's a real oversimplification, but um, there's not quite the monotheistic focus in, 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 in popular Hinduism. Um, it's, it's accepted that the divine takes on many forms and incarnates not into just a single human personality, but incarnates into a variety of sort of sub-deities and many, many avatars through history. And uh, so the Hindu explanation will be a little bit uh, more complicated, but the basic logic will be the same. There's God or the divine, and the divine infuses the world with information at some point historically, and then religion happens. I mean, in Hinduism, I think, uh, you know, an Orthodox Hindu will mention events like the revelation of the, of the Vedas or the central scriptures, which I guess are the, the sort of heard word of the divine and um, when that happened will be a subject of contention but this is the the traditional picture of how religion happens now the question is whether we can explain the phenomenon of religion in all of its complexity and depth 
and profundity and diversity without this in the picture, right? If just sticking to the natural world, including the social animals in the world, like us, we can explain how religion happens and we can explain all of the particular experiences that happen under the category of religion, including very intense mystical experiences, including the tenacity of religious belief, you know, the fact that almost every culture we're familiar with, small and large, has something we would identify as, as religiosity in it, often at the very heart of it. We can explain why humans devote so much of their energy to religion historically. I mean, if you look at the great construction projects of history, pyramids and cathedrals might spring to mind. Well, these are maybe primarily, certainly the cathedrals are primarily religious, I don't want to say quite monuments because they're functional, but in a way they're, they're testaments to the glory of God. And they're also pieces of religious technology, sort of. I mean, the pyramid is like a spaceship designed to get the Pharaoh into, well, not space, but into, into the afterlife. And uh, uh, the cathedral is, among other things, a amplifier of the conjoined prayers of its um, inhabitants, the, the, the choir within, and it amplifies it and concentrates that voice into an apex and sends it up to the heavens. Um, we put a lot of energy into religion and a good non-religious or naturalist, naturalist explanation of religion will stick to the world, but not turn religion into a cartoon, not ignore um, the varieties of religious experience and not do something cheap like say, Oh, religion is all just um, wishful thinking, or religion is all just uh, in the interest of the rich or the powerful. There's a temptation when, when we explain a complicated thing like religion to seek a sort of magic bullet, single theory explanation. Probably the correct naturalist explanation of religion, if there is one, will be multifaceted. It will have it will just be a conjunction, maybe a pretty messy conjunction of many, many argumentative or explanatory strategies. We'll look at a few uh, today. And again, I don't think any one of these is correct. Maybe all four of them together, plus 20 others, and applied wisely and carefully to the variety of religious phenomena could, could do a pretty good job uh, explaining uh, human religion. But let's take these one at a time. So um, number one, unitive mystical experiences are caused by reduced activity in the posterior superior parietal lobe. That's the back top of the brain, a particular area associated with um, associated with uh, maybe among other things, uh, self-awareness, bodily awareness, proprioceptive sense, I think, and people who've suffered damage to this part of the brain often have a hard time maintaining uh, posture. It's like they've lost a clear sense of where their body ends and where the world begins, I gather. And isn't it interesting, Andrew Newberg has found, he's a researcher at, I think, Penn State or U Pennsylvania. And he's he's been bringing meditators and contemplatives from the Catholic and Buddhist traditions into his brain lab on campus and uh, watching their brains electronically, scanning their brains in real time as they go into deep meditative states. And he's found a number of things, but one of his interesting findings is that this part of the brain goes electrically quiet when the meditators and the prayers go deep into their um, into their religious sort of trance. And of course, if you've suffered damage to this part of the brain or had, had it excised, you've got severely reduced electrical activity there. So this, this sounds a little bit insulting, but it's like the meditators are temporarily 
undergoing a kind of damage to this part of their brain. Or it's just, it's not, it's been quiet and it's not working. Maybe that's a good thing for a time. But anyway, they have that in common with the people who've suffered damage to this part of the brain. And there's, you know, the people who've suffered the damage lose their body sense. And so too do the prayers often report feeling one with the world, right? That's the gold standard of mystical experience that you um, feel a dissolving of the boundaries between the self and the world, between the self and other people. It's it's a thing that's very hard to describe. I mean, it's easy to say those words, but it's 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 a real experience, and it's not arrived at just through um, just through meditation and prayer. That's one way humans have figured out to get to that experience. But it's a widely reported kind of experience, and not just from days of yore. But there are these people who are very practiced at getting into that state, and you can quite reliably get into states and very similar states by, for example taking powerful uh, psychedelics like psilocybin or LSD or maybe ayahuasca. And among other states you'll experience is um, unitive mystical experiences. You know, if you ingest five or six grams of psilocybin mushroom. So this is, these, these experiences are real. So again, a very cheap naturalist explanation of mystical experience would be Oh, they're all just lying. You know, they're all just trying to get attention. That's just that's just a terrible explanation because it's just not sensitive to the evidence. If you're sensitive to the evidence, you'll your good sense will 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 tell you there's something real here, real at least as sincerely reported experiences, uh, which yes are hard to describe and yes are very different from ordinary uh, experience where we feel the distinctions between ourselves and the world, but. Anyway, these experiences are real as experiences. And Newberg takes them seriously as experiences. That's why he's studying them in the lab. He doesn't think they're fake. He wasn't trying to out these meditators as fakes. He was trying to figure out what's going on when they have these very profound experiences. Um, so now is, is, is the conclusion from all this that therefore there is no God? Absolutely not. I mean, I think, I think the Buddhist, well, let's take the Catholic, the Catholic, maybe nun or monk who was brought into the lab. If afterwards Newberg explained, look, this is what happened while well, you went deep into your unit of state, would, would that justifi justifiably cause the nun to become an atheist? <laughs> I think not. I mean, I think the nun could rightly say, well, that's, that's interesting. Um, God works through the world and through through its structures. When I see the tree, something's going on in my brain. Also, when I go to sleep, something's quieting in my brain. With with every experience we have, there's something going on in our brain correlated to that experience. That alone does not show that the experience is not of something real. So. It's not surprising that the brain has a particular signature when people are in communion with God. Even if God were real, it wouldn't be surprising if your brain had a particular signature when you're in communion with God. I mean, when you perform the ontological argument, let's say the ontological argument is valid, it's sound, it works, and if you think about it carefully, you really will justifiably come to the conclusion that God exists. Well, when you're thinking through the premises of the ontologic argument and inferring the conclusion, there's something going on in your brain there too. A lot more specific than just one chunk of it going electrically quiet. But, you know, in neuroscience, a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now could give a very precise description of what, what changed in your brain when you were thinking about the ontological argument and, and maybe could say, look, when anyone is thinking about the ontological argument, that's maybe a little specific, or at least when anyone is thinking through a deductive argument, there's a kind of subtle signature, which we've figured out now through our brain scanner of the 31st century. And um, that wouldn't show that therefore the argument isn't valid. So this is an important point. I want, I want you to understand that though we're talking about naturalist explanations of religion in the same unit as, as, as the problem of evil, 
and both are you know part of the atheist or agnostic toolbox i mean if you want to be a uh a thorough justified atheist you'll want to be able to pull out the problem of evil um, that's part of your strategy and i think you also want to explain how it is religion happens and how people uh, take on these beliefs and practices uh, but unlike Mackey's deductive argument the conclusion of these naturalistic explanations is never therefore god does not and cannot exist rather it's almost like the naturalist explanations are the second thing or the last thing you want to do after you've proven god doesn't exist so ideally as an atheist you'll prove that god doesn't exist and then you'll say okay now we've got this thing to explain called religion how did it happen so there's no vertical top-down transmission from god into world how would religion happen then making available just the resources of the natural sciences social sciences and some common sense and cultural theory and what have you um and we, i started with ex this example because religion often starts with mystical experience if you look at the historical origins of a lot of major faith traditions they begin with a prophet or a mystic who's had some very powerful experiences and they're not all liars um, they've had very powerful experiences and they've come down from the mountain or left their cave or cell and or the desert and returned to town and then spoken to the people tr tried to translate like in poetry and song and Sikhism Grunanic sings song often and sp speaks forth poetry after returning from his uh, immersion of three days in in the river in, in Punjab uh, they return to the village or the town and they speak their experience to people and you've got to explain that and respect that experience and it, to be atheist doesn't mean um, if that's your ambition <laughs> and you're taking this course to gain some uh, you know ammunition for your atheism to be a good atheist that doesn't mean being disrespectful of religion in fact it in a way it's the opposite it means you fully respect the thing you're trying to explain you can't explain it if you don't respect it you're not explaining it if you don't respect it in all its depth and complexity so um what we can do with this kind of experience and newberg doesn't think that this is this is the magic bullet explanation of mystical experience from what i can tell it's just it's just this this is the kind of thing that will help flesh out a naturalist explanation Here's a second naturalist explanation of religion. Think about this word, anthropomorphic. Anthropos is from the Greek for man or human. And morph is form, form. So something is anthropomorphic if it has human form. Of course, humans are anthropomorphic. We have human form, but um, a statue is also anthropomorphic it's stone that has been shaped by human um, uh, labor into human form and uh, a lot of our cartoons are anthropomorphic you know disney and pixar are full of anthropomorphized cars and toys and uh, non-human animals of course in, in the case of the non-human animals the animals are quite like us to begin with unlike the stone maybe but uh, certainly in the like the looney tunes universe these animals are highly anthropomorphized they speak english and they you know have mexican accents and they um you know they live in the city and what have you religion is anthropomorphic projection to project is to um color the world like yourself it's like if you're feeling blue and the world looks blue to you everything looks sad and gray and depressing that's you projecting your state onto the world maybe if you're feeling so happy that 
you can't imagine not being happy and you assume that the room of people you're talking to are basically happy too and you can't you can't see that a lot of them are depressed or annoyed with you you're doing a bit of projection there too i guess it sounds like a negative thing in the way i'm describing it it's it, it is a mistake um to project it's to impose on something outside of you something that is not true to it and the view that religion is anthropomorphic projection is the view that religion is just us painting the universe in our form. So when we imagine the universe is overseen by a Shiva or a Zeus, well, I guess Shiva, or the destroyer, the changer, rather than the over, I guess the overseer would be Vishnu, more preserver, but Zeus is certainly the head honcho god, sort of the overseer of the universe, so he doesn't seem as interested in the in the world as maybe Yahweh is. When uh, Indian religion and ancient Greek religion uh, imagine the universe having this kind of human, human-like intelligence and power at the top of it or at the heart of it, that's according to this theory anthropomorphic projection it's us having a hard time imagining the universe being inhuman non-human unconscious now over here we've got a page from i remember this is a page from a medieval theological description of the deity it's probably a page from saint thomas aquinas and um Here too, though we don't see a picture, a very obvious anthropomorphism in the description, descriptive terms like powerful, intelligent, loving, right? The, the, the key uh, features of the definition of God we've talked about. Um, that's projection too. So projection can be literally giving this kind of physical human form um, and clothing to we're doing it's like we're doing it to the universe it's like what are we doing it to what are we projecting to well there's not there's nothing out there and we're projecting onto it this human form it's like we're turning the universe into a mirror and uh seeing an enlarged reflection of ourselves in it it's obvious in the case of statuary it's less obvious in the case of abstract philosophical descriptions of god but in the the way we describe God or the divine, there's possibly projection going on there too. Like the idea that God is, well, God doesn't have a body, but God is loving and intelligent and very interested in humans. That sounds very human. <laughs> humans have love and are in, clever and uh, are very interested in humans. Maybe in talking about God, we're just talking about ourselves. And according to Feuerbach, Ludwig Feuerbach, did I write his name? We'll see if I wrote his name on the next slide. But um, um, according to Feuerbach, who's maybe the, the name best associated with this theory, Feuerbach with Ludwig Feuerbach was writing in the uh, 1800s in Germany. And he, he, uh, he points out that early in religion, either historically or in its maturing and development, it has a very obvious anthropomorphism. And the people aren't at all ashamed or um, skeptical of that. They easily accept that God maybe literally has a kind of body. And they don't maybe think too carefully about exactly where God is and exactly how big, uh, you know, what his shoe size is. But they're quite comfortable with the idea that God is quite a lot like us. And as we get more sophisticated in our thinking and we start to, you know, we grow up and become aware of this projection or the possibility that we're projecting, the, the fear that we're doing it, we get rid of this very physical form of God. I mean, I think most most Hindus, if you talk to them today, today they don't believe that Shiva literally has a physical body and lives literally um, in a Himalayan retreat uh, sitting on a tiger skin. Um, they take that to be the iconography of a much more abstract, non-physical being. But um, 
that, according to Feuerbach, that movement from very explicit anthropomorphism to this more abstract version, that's a reflection of the psychological discomfort we have with projection. It's like we realize we're making some kind of childish mistake. And so we strip away the images of the God. And in fact, we get very angry when other people do it. That's the, if you look in the, in the monotheistic traditions, they have a very strong injunction against what they call idolatry. Um, and they smash the idols of the neighboring tribes who still dare to depict God. That's, uh, that's a kind of projection too. That's the, that's the anxiety of the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians with their own anthropomorphism, Feuerbach would say. And they're taking it out on um, the idol worshipers. They are erasing the idol worshipers from the world because the idol worshipers show them, the Muslim, Jew, and the Christian, their own anthropomorphism, which has moved into a more abstraction, but it's, it's still there. Childlike condition of humanity. This is a quote from Feuerbach. I guess I should write his name out now. Boy, that's a, that's a long German name, man. Foy, and I'm writing with a mouse, as you can hear. Oh my God, this is awful. So unprofessional. Foyer, let's see if I can touch screen that. Mm. Oh, okay, B. This is certainly the worst slide in my history of PowerPoint. Feuerbach, cute kid, no offense to the kid, but uh, I've just graffitied all around the kid. Feuerbach, Ludwig Feuerbach um, is the uh, name most associated with this projection theory. He was, uh, his views were taken up more famously by Sigmund Freud in the 20th century. Sigmund Freud read Feuerbach, I think their lives somewhat um, were uh, uh, contemporary, uh, Freud a little bit later. But, but Freud develops this theory very famously and, and applies it more specifically to his um, you know, family psychology. So that uh, in Freud, God is specifically a father figure. I mean, he's thinking about m m Jewish monotheism in particular. God is this father figure we project uh, because we, um, we're childish. We can't give up. the protection that our real human father once afforded us. Now, this is one kid, uh, you probably figured out, a kid looking into a mirror. And I, I guess we can only speculate, um, though psychologists have tried, maybe they've succeeded. I can only speculate on what exactly is going on in the, in the mind of the real child. Of course, nothing's going on in the mind of the reflected child. This is the mirror. But let's say that this baby doesn't understand mirrors yet and has actually just stumbled upon his, I'll say his, uh, first mirror and actually thinks that he's made a new friend you know, he thinks he's in pre-nursery school here and has just crawled over, crawled into his parents' bedroom and there's this uh, floor-length mirror at the closet door and he's, he's peering into this mirror and thinks he's made a new friend. And notice that the kid, the real kid, is maybe pre-linguistically making observations about, quote-unquote, his new friend. And correctly observing things like, ah, oh, my new friend has a very cute smile and big blue eyes and likes me. And da, 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 And is a lot like me. Um, everything this real kid is saying about his reflection is correct, but with one framing mistake, one sort of uh, ascriptive mistake, the kid thinks the reflection is somebody else when really the kid is just talking about himself. So yeah, you do have blue eyes. You do have a cute smile. You do like yourself. You are a lot like yourself. Everything you said was true, but you just ascribe these uh, properties, characteristics to something else. And that something else is not there. It's not real. I mean, the mirror is real, but the being the mirror is giving off is not real. And this, according to Feuerbach, is what we're doing in early projective religion. 
we're describing ourselves. When we praise God, we're describing human nature, both the dark and the light sides of it. And we're just making this little logical mistake. It's like we're, we're doing self-reflection. We're reflecting on human nature when we uh, talk about God and when we, when we do perfect being theology, we're talking about ourselves. Of course, we're not omnipotent or omniscient. We're pretty powerful and uh, pretty smart. Uh, so the mirror of religion is more like a fun, old style funhouse mirror that enlarges you. When you stand in front of it, suddenly you're 20 feet tall and a little bit distorted and uh, the proportions have changed. And so it's, it's extra hard to recognize that it's you, right? Religion is an adaptation in the Darwinian sense that increases group cohesion, the group of society, the tribe or the larger tribe like the hajis at Mecca. And, and any social animal needs to play well with others, not just um, to be nice to others, but for their own well-being. Um, you should listen to your parents when you're six months old. <laughs> Actually, it's not hard. When you're six months, you just naturally are in the power of others. You're naturally cohered to your mommy. And you take what she gives you and you sort of do what she says and you go where she goes. You're like an exteriorized fetus. And so group cohesion is not a problem in our early years, but as we gain independence, um, there's risk that we will act in a way contrary to the interests of the tribe and, and thus contrary to our own interests because our own interests are tied to the tribe. We can't survive on our own. Um, we're a social animal. And imagine two tribes then. Imagine a tribe that has religion and a tribe that doesn't. According to this view, this is a bit oversimplified, but according to this view, the tribe that has religion, all else being equal between the two tribes, the, the religious tribe will do better at surviving and reproducing and spreading. And that's how religion happens. It's an evolutionary adaptation that goes back many, many tens of thousands, probably its roots go hundreds of thousands of years back. In, into sort of our deeper primate history. And it, um, it's one of the many ways, one of the many ways nature has adapted us to work with the group we're in. So here are adaptations. Here's the bunny ears. Adaptations can take the form of a physical feature of an organism, can also take the form of a behavior like the rabbit stomp, the ears maybe let the rabbit know there's a, a, a suspicious possible predator that's entered the field and the stomp might follow. The stomp might be, well, getting blood into the hind legs to get ready to bolt and jump, but it's also maybe warning fellow Warren members or maybe warn members below that there's a fox or a hawk around. Um, but, uh, so, so adaptation doesn't just mean the spots on the leopard or the opposable thumb of the human. It's also behaviors that have, like nipple seeking of the infant, that's a behavior. Um, <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is behavior, right? This, uh, this is the Haji circ circumambulating at, uh, at Mecca. And that's a behavior. Mecca itself, the construction is, is a feature, a little bit more like the rabbit's ear or a little bit more like the spider's web or the beaver's dam, perhaps an exteriorized, relatively stable physical feature that the organism uses. And so you got to think about if, if religion's an adaptation, it's going to be both features, maybe even physical features of the organism, like parts of the brain that have been developed and specialized. And then the behaviors, of course, this is a very specific behavior of a specific religion and maybe fairly recent, but the behavior of gathering at a large monolith or central idol or central a place of worship of some kind, that's much older. I mean, that predates the city, that predates civilization. And I think um, we can only speculate about how far something like that really goes. Um, that's a behavior, a little bit more like the rabbit's stomp. And so a good Darwinist or evolutionary or adaptational explanation of religion will want to 
explain all of these things. How does religion get you to play well with others? Well, it's funny, partly just by making it in your interest to do things with them. I mean, whatever else these hajis are doing, they're doing it together. They're in sync. They're circumambulating together. When people get in a church and sing in a choir, whatever the words are, and half the time people don't even know the words. They're singing in Latin or they're singing in medieval Punjabi and the Gurdwara, and they, uh, uh, they don't even know what words they're singing, but they're singing together and the song feels good. So what's going on is they're, they're being rewarded with something that feels good. And what feels good is doing something with others. So religion is one way we just get positively reinforced to work with others. It also gives us a belief system that whether true or not, just we can believe together. And it's, it's interesting that a lot of religious beliefs are the kinds of beliefs that you can never prove false. I mean, maybe we'll try to in this course now and then, like with the problem of evil. But I think in the end, you might realize that it's, it's really impossible to satisfyingly disprove the existence of God so that that ghost is banished forever from human thought or temptation. It's, it's, it's a, a kind of maybe what's called unfalsifiable belief. And religion might specialize in these unfalsifiable beliefs of a very general nature. And one reason religion might specialize in these unfalsifiable beliefs is their beliefs we can all believe together and no one could ever disprove. And so they're long lasting, stable beliefs that we can believe together. <laughs> and believing is something we do, just like walking is something we do. And so religion gets you to walk together. And believing is something to do. Religion gets you to believe together. So you get in the habit of working with the group. This is a, a, a view of religion associated with Marx and Engels, actually the most famous quote here, which I've paraphrased. Uh, maybe, maybe that's the exact wording in English. Um, Engels uh, said, religion is the opiate or drug of the masses and not just any drug. I mean, some drugs get you excited some drugs make you anxious. Some drugs put you to sleep. Some drugs make you feel okay and maybe then put you to sleep. The opiums are more in that class. They, uh, at least in the way Engels thought of the Victorian opium den. You, uh, you, you smoke your opium and then you're in a la la dream world, uh, Kublai Khan palace where everything is, everything is peachy. I mean, maybe you've got spit and vomit dribbling down your shirt you haven't washed for three weeks and you're leaned up against the dirty wall of some 19th century crack house basically but uh, inside you feel great because of the drug this is the way Engels was thinking of opium and he, he said that religion is the same for the masses and by the masses the Marxists mean the sort of 99 percent the the people who lack economic power and are sort of ruled over by these dudes. And according to the, this Marxist view, religion serves the interests of the powerful by drugging the masses and helping them accept their place in the world. Think of the Indian caste system, right? I mean, if you're uh, on the lowest rungs of that caste, and you start wondering too much about why those above you have more access rights and uh, more resources and can tell you what to do and um, have power of life and death over you in some cases. I, you know, well, if you believe that you deserve to be in that caste because of past life karmic death, or you believe that you too will be a Brahmin someday, someday being a future life, you will be, you will ascend through the caste system too. So that you think, well, I really am a Brahmin in the future. I shall be a Brahmin too. And he, the Brahmin was once an outcast or a, 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 you know, a lower caste. Well, this is, I mean, maybe the cat, maybe karma is true. Maybe um, the caste system is the correct way to set up society. But even if it's not true, it, it's, a, it's a system which actually works pretty well for the Brahmins. You might, you might think a little bit cynically. 
but realistically. If uh, you're a medieval pe peasant, so this is the medieval European world, if you're one of the peasants watching in awe this crowning ceremony of the Pope, Pope Leo III crowning Charlemagne as emperor, and you, you start to wonder, well, why, why does he get the crown? Why does he get the silken robe and the furs? And why am I scratching the fleas on my body and eating crusty bread? Christianity preaches a opium-like gospel to you. It says, you, the poor, will inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, it says, uh, life is a bridge. Build no, uh, build no house upon it. Don't get too wrapped up in the world. Uh, leave behind all your possessions. In fact, those with possessions are those um, who are being weighed down and can't fly free to heaven. Uh, so um, this sermon preaches a gospel that is music to your ears if you're poor. Not only does it say you're okay, it says you're gonna, everything's going to be okay in the end. Everything's going to be, in fact, perfect forever after this world. This world is just a blip and eternity is forever. I mean, that's, that's one of the central messages you can take from the Christian tradition. And you can see that its effect on the masses would be to placate them, to really uh, deflate them of revolutionary impulse. People who believe that this world is just a fleeting, unimportant moment, a sort of anteroom to eternity aren't going to be storming the streets and uh, uh, camping out in Zuccotti Park for uh, three months and uh, demanding the fall of Wall Street. Right. Why, get, why get worked up about it? Nor will they be storming the stage to demand justice for the European peasants. So I, I don't think the Marxist view would be that in the year 333 BC, the rich and powerful of the world got together in an oak paneled room and uh, cackled and uh, gleefully made finger tents with their, um, with their um, long uh, elderly fingers and plotted world domination and as part of their five point plan, invented this thing called religion, which would opiate the masses. It's, it's in fact, I think a sophisticated Marxist would, would recognize that it's actually better for the system. The system will work. The hierarchy will work better and the king will rule more effectively. The king himself believes it. So you don't need to, in the Marxist view, imagine that all the rich people know that religion is a sham and all the poor people are fooled by it. Everyone might believe it. And it turns out to be in the interest of the few. This is sort of the Marxist view. So we've got a kind of flavor now of these non-religious explanations of religion. We've looked at four examples. And uh, now we'll turn our attention to uh, a particular theorist named Pascal Boyer and some of his thoughts in this, in this vein. Right. Look at the very ambitious title of Pascal Boyer's book. And don't confuse this Pascal with the Blaise Pascal, whose wager we've already looked at. This is Pascal Boyer, a contemporary uh, cognitive scientist. I think that would be his neighborhood of expertise. And uh, anthropologist, cognitive scientist. And uh, Blaise Pascal was a mathematician and philosopher and theologian, I guess. 300 years ago. Okay, well, uh, in fact, we're not going to uh, cover the part of Boyer's book where he explains religion. We're using the first preparatory part of Boyer's work where he surveys competing explanations of religion to his own and uh, shows their inadequacies. So, uh, and, and in fact, we're just going to talk about the first, the first two. This term scenarios is uh, um, maybe not all that helpful. Uh, intellectual scenarios are, are um, intellectual, 
intellectualist theories of religion. Emotive scenarios are emotivist theories of religion. Each of these four is a way of explaining religion, and you can see each has its own sort of central thesis. So according to the intellectualist theories of religion, religion <laughs> provides explanations. We're getting pretty meta here, but um, um, according to this first type of explanation of religion, which is what we're trying to do in this unit, according to this explanation, religion itself has the purpose of providing humans with explanations of the universe and their place in it, and some other things. <laughs> so that covers quite a bit. And that explains why religion is popular, why religion arose historically and is so persistent and has such a hold on our uh, psychology. According to the emotivist scenarios, religion arose and persists in human experience because it provides humans with uh, psychological comfort. And remember when, when I mentioned Sigmund Freud's adaptation of Feuerbach, and Feuerbach himself um, had this idea that... Um, it's not just that we project God onto the empty canvas of the cosmos because it's it's like an infantile mistake. It's that doing so uh, gives us comfort. The idea that the natural world is actually under the control of a, a super person who cares about us, in fact, is centrally concerned with human well-being. I mean, notice that. I mean, that's the story of God. God is the being who controls the whole thing and cares about nothing more than human beings and that, that things should turn out well for human beings. Well, this is a very comfort, comforting idea. And we can say that, uh, therefore, even if it were false, and maybe even if humans had no evidence for it, and maybe even if uh, there were loads of evidence weighing against the uh, existence of God, we might continue to believe it because it's so comforting. False comforts or falsehoods that are comforting uh, are motivated Okay, we'll take these uh, theories one by one and we'll look at Boyer's criticisms of them. Remember, Boyer is canvassing these intellectual and emotivist and other uh, scenarios or theories only to, to show their inadequacies and clear the ground for his own theory, which we're not going to talk about and which, frankly, I don't, I don't remember very well. It's been a long time since I've read the book through, but... Um, Here's his description of intellectual theories. Remember, this is not Boyer's own view. He's summarizing a view that's out there, which is common in theory of religion. Religion arises gradually, historically, who knows when, uh, certainly thousands of years ago, maybe tens of thousands of years ago. In response to our persistent fundamental desire to explain events and processes, all animals are curious. Um, they're aware of their environment and they're interested in novelties in their environment and certainly quote unquote interested in threats that enter their field of awareness um, and uh, would like to know more about these threats or possible benefits. I mean, that's just woven deep into animal psychology and part of animal animation or mobility is to explore Maybe some animals are a little more curious than others. Uh, some animals have it in their repertoire to uh, maybe keep their nose to the ground a bit more and just uh, stick to a kind of routine that 
evolution has worked out for them that works quite well in their in their little niche but uh, some animals are and and we seem to be uh, infinitely curious we very much lift our nose from the ground uh, literally and figuratively and look up to the heavens and wonder what is that ball of fire in the sky really and is that fire the same as the fire we learned to make last week here in sub-Saharan Africa. We're the curious animal, the supremely curious animal. And <clears throat> this curiosity is what creates religion. Religion arises, maybe, in the void springing up between our questions and um, our ignorance. Or just say that religion arises to fill the void of our ignorance. We we have curiosity, but we don't have answers. And we want so badly to have answers. We want that feeling of, aha, I understand, I get it, I know what's going on, right? That's, that's curiosity is, is an agitation. And a curious animal is, is like a hungry animal or like a uh, horny animal. It's seeking some kind of satisfaction of that desire. And for um, the curious, that satisfaction is the feeling of getting it. It's, it's a distinct, kind of pleasure it probably has a slightly bodily component but it feels quite mental it's the pleasure you get when you uh you know you probably you probably have a cell phone game that you like to play where you're solving little puzzles with colorful pieces and th those games are really just like well they're like parasites <laughs> informational parasites that take advantage of your native curiosity and maybe maybe this is cynical of me but and I'm speaking as an ex-video game addict, but uh, these games are really desi designed in our informational ecosystem to um, drain you of your curiosity, to give you your daily fix of question mark and then check mark. And uh, maybe to leave you no juice to contemplate more interesting questions. Anyway, that's a little bit cynical and a little bit off track. The point is, uh, curiosity is rewarded with at least the feeling of having found an answer. So religion arises because we, we like that feeling. And um, we want to explain things like puzzling natural phenomena or puzzling mental phenomena or a little more philosophically, the origin of things. Okay, I know I came from my mommy and daddy. I figured that out. And I know my mommy and daddy came from their mommy and daddy. But where do mommy and daddyhood come from? Where do uh, people come from? Where does this whole thing we move around in come from? Where did the sky come from? We ask these questions. Maybe, maybe we're... Maybe we're the only animal uh, on earth right now who does ask these questions. I don't know. Uh, but, um, well, we're the only ones who ask them in English. Um, and then the fourth thing we try to explain, evil and suffering, more practically. We want to know why, like the robot in The Simpsons uh, um, running burning a flame from the robot factory fire. We cry out, why, why was I created to feel pain? And that's something religion provides an answer to. Well, it's uh, you repaying karmic debt you've accrued in your life in this realm. Pain is uh, the remedy and life is the poison, maybe, in a maybe more uh, subcontinental, pessimistic view of, of life. Uh, pain gets you to, gets you motivated to leave life, and life is something you're supposed to leave to attain enlightenment and un unity with God again. Puzzling mental phenomena. What what's a puzzling mental phenomenon? Well, you know what? Uh, of course, things like dreams are just 
crazy. And and they're so puzzling and so extraordinary. You might not think they're just mental phenomena. I mean, that's why you want to explain them. When you wake up from a dream, you can feel like you've just returned from a journey to another dimension or realm or from your past. You've traveled in time. And you might ask, is this just in my head? Is this, is this just my imagination? Um, running undistracted by the light of day? Or is, uh, is this actually some kind of like astral traveling? Well, when you take the latter sort of answer, you're getting into a kind of religious metaphysics. You're now positing the existence of realms outside of the natural. So to explain, to get that aha feeling from dreams, we start positing a religious reality. Puzzling mental phenomena would also include experience through psychedelics, through psychoactive substances. And these are not a 20th century thing. I mean, in the 20th century, we get a, at least among our first lab made psychoactives like LSD and amphetamines and and so on, but um, it seems like it seems like every tribe has its favored bit of flora and sometimes fauna that they uh, eat or grind up or boil or smoke or lick, uh, and which alters their consciousness quite profoundly. Often, um, you know, the tobacco of of North American indigenous use is. I don't think it's it's a trip in the same way that the South American indigenous ayahuasca is. The ayahuasca will um, take you outside of your mind and provide you with a sort of class A ecstatic experience and uh, cure you of your atheism. I mean, uh, there are a lot of contemporary reports of modern rationalist, naturalist atheists out of curiosity, trying ayahuasca, um, whose main active molecule is DMT, and coming out of that experience, that, those nine hours, um, believing now in other realms, right? The, the mental experiences are so powerful, one feels forced to interpret them as more than just mental. They're so powerful that one says, this is not just in my head. You encounter entities in this experience, which feel so vivid. And these entities often seem to have prophetic knowledge. They tell you things that you didn't know and you couldn't have known such that you feel, okay, this, I, I left my head and I went somewhere and met something which my daylight categories can't explain very well. So uh, a lot of religion, I mean, the connection between religion and psychedelics is, is uh, I don't want to say it's understudied. I've understudied it. I haven't looked into what scholars have said about that connection, but, but um, you know, there's, I mean, the connection is clear. It's, it doesn't need to be argued in a sense. It's, I mean, wh wherever these, psychedelics are used, they're treated as sacraments, and they're often quite central to the religious life of the tribes that use them, like the ayahuasca among the Amazonian Indians or the peyote of the Mesoamericans. Um, their, their, their divine ecosystem, their ecosystem of deities and entities is often accessed through this substance. And it's uh, the day you take the substance, that's church, that's Christmas, that's Easter. Um, so from dreams and psychedelics alone, remember with the naturalist explanation of religion, remember that first diagram, religion says God into world, that explains religion and, and naturalism says, let's stick, let's stick to world. Well, in fact, just sticking to dreams and psychedelics, you, you could explain quite a bit of religious life, I think, about its origins. That would be enough to get religion started. Just the fact that we dream and we, you know, smoke weed um, and then puzzling natural phenomena. What would a, 
example of a puzzling natural phenomenon be? Well, notice that if you're curious enough, if you're philosophical enough, if you love wisdom enough, and you look at your world with cleansed eyes, everything is puzzling and um, infinitely curious. But I think Boyer has in mind here the, um, well, first of all, the major orderly features of our environment, like the rising of the sun and its setting, right? or the, twi the, 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 the starry sky, or the sky itself. I mean, these major dramatic features of our environment, the persistent, regular features, which are so grand and so, uh, so frame our life that we can't help but ask about them at some point. But puzzling natural phenomena could also be very disruptive, irregular, unpredictable phenomena like lightning. Lightning and thunder would be the classic examples of that. Things which we can't quite predict and which are very dramatic so that you, you got to stand, your ears prick up and you notice. And you and they also, you know, they've got a bit of the mysterium tremendum in them. Certainly thunder is the, is the, the classic sound of the tremendum. And there's a reason that Indra and Zeus control thunder and or lightning. And uh, we ask, well, what, what causes that? You know, to be curious is, is not just to go cool. Uh, it's to go cool. Um, how? Who? Why? And so on. So too with mental phenomena, if you're philosophical, uh, the fact that you have a mind is the, the most curious thing. The, the banal fact that you've got consciousness that the, the, you, you're, you know, that your meat machine has this ghost riding it called the mind or the spirit or the soul or the personality. Awareness. Awareness is this aura, um, which doesn't seem to be physical. Awareness is not physical. It can be of physical things. I'm aware of the rock. But the awareness is not physical. What is it? Well, that's awareness itself. Mental life itself is puzzling. And as we, I mean, I don't know who the first caveman was to ask, cave person, cave child was to ask, uh, what is awareness? But uh, of course, they didn't call it awareness in 30,000 BC. They didn't have the word awareness. They called it shmamerness. Ah, psychedelics. I'll let you uh, pause and read someone's, this is a modern, uh, per, uh, you know, modern youngster, I think. Someone very much like you or me who tried DMT. And they're reporting back to the tribe what they experienced. And it sounds pretty, sounds like a gateway drug to religion. And here's some really extraordinary art <clears throat> from an Amazonian shaman, Pablo Amaringo. I think he passed away. But um, he was a Amazonian shaman. That might be him or his kind. That might be him. And these are folks who've gathered in the jungle to sip some ayahuasca brew. And it just takes a sip and you go on a trip. And then one minute you're sitting in a circle and sipping something like thick, reduced espresso, but worse tasting. And then the next minute the reality dragon is speaking to you in an Oxfordian accent and revealing great wisdoms of your life and wormholes to other dimensions are vibrating, oscillating and awaiting your choice, your entry. You can enter any, any one of them for eternity an eternity that will wrap up nicely in nine or 10 hours. Uh, well, the shaman is like the priest of his tribe and part of his priesthood is his brewing and guiding 
is the ayahuasca. Okay, so we've just summarized Boyer's summary of these uh, intellectualist explanations of religion. Got to keep our levels of discourse straight here. Who's talking and who's talking about who? So we've, we've just summarized Boyer talking about other people talking about religion. And here we get one of Boyer's objections or criticisms of objections to or criticisms of that position. We'll call that position A1. A1 here represents the intellectualist scenario or intellectualist approach to explaining religion. And here's a criticism by Boyer of that. He says, I don't think the point of religion historically has been primarily to explain puzzling things. Why? Well, Boyer says religious explanations are often so weak or regressive, take you on an infinite regress like, like the design argument might, who made God? Okay, God made the world, well, who made God? So these are bad explanations. So what? It's unlikely they're meant to explain. Boyer, this is a really interesting point Boyer makes. Most people would say, uh, yeah, they're bad explanations, but that's just because humans were in the infancy of their scientific curiosity and uh, competence. And so uh, religion is what happens when we've got the scientific bug, but we haven't yet acquired the lab experience to formulate correct answers to the questions. Boyer takes a different tack and he's, he's really thinking like uh, evolutionist here. He's, he's approaching the human animal from a Darwinian lens and, and supposing that the animal, in this case, the human animal, is not going to waste a ton of its energy on a activity, including a mental or cultural activity, like religion, that is useless. And if religious explanations are, are so weak, um, that means as explanations, they're pretty useless. And therefore, the adaptive logic of religion is probably not to help humans explain things. That that's a sort of side effect of religious activity and energy that it gives us these sort of explanations of reality but according to Boyer that's probably not its primary purpose uh before we talk about the emotive scenarios you'll want to take it a step further you want to now think of what we could say in response to Boyer. So we would want to respond, reply to his objection on behalf of the intellectualist scenarios, just to keep the discussion going. I mean, whatever side we end up taking, I mean, I think we're all very far from taking really definite sides on this and we should just keep the discussion going. And one way you keep the discussion going is by just providing a counterpoint for the sake of argument, as they say. So. Uh, you know, one, one way you could push back against Boyer there and say, well, you know, they, they are bad explanations maybe, uh, but they were good enough. And the need they served was just the need we talked about. It was, was, was uh, um, um, you know, calming our curiosity, which is a kind of agitation. When the animal is agitated, it needs to be calmed at some point. And an animal who's too agitated with curiosity about why the stars twinkle uh, is going to be a less productive animal. And so religion arises to <clears throat> uh, soothe our curiosity. Uh, so the fact that the explanations are, from a modern scientific perspective, not satisfying, though that's not even true. I mean, we've seen that by from just scientific curiosity through analyzing the fine-tuning data, you can get pushed into belief in some kind of creator. From Nick Bostrom's simulation argument, this is a different... Uh, Maybe it's a different course, but uh, you might infer that our reality is a little bit programmed and there's probably some kind of programmer outside of it. I mean, religious explanations are not just bad explanations. They're, they, they have, I mean, 
Aquinas was not an idiot. But um, <clears throat> a lot of them are bad. And a lot of them, I think we can clearly see, uh, just aren't correct. But they may have worked. They were good enough to uh, get most people, most of the time, to say, okay, that makes sense. And now I can continue with um, my hunting and gathering or whatever it is I was doing 82,000 years ago and um, not be over bothered. <coughs> Again, um, I mean, another way of responding to Boyer is to say, actually, they they are excellent explanations. Actually, in religion, if you can translate into into modern forms of thought, you know, translate from the metaphor and the myth and poetry of religion into modern uh, clarified expositional talk, you'll find some very good explanations or the roots of some of our best explanations of reality. So, um Anyway, let's talk about uh, the second. Remember, this is from Boyer's list of ways of explaining religion, but these are ways that he doesn't agree with ultimately. So he's nicely summarizing them for us and then, and then usually always um, pushing back at them with his objections. So according to the emotivist scenarios, religion serves some deep emotional need. You can see already there's a, a blur between the last um, uh, scenario and this one because um, explaining things is actually a deep emotional need. <laughs> We're curious animals, so uh, we have a deep emotional need. It feels good uh, to explain. But I think here when we talk about emotive scenarios and emotional needs here, we're talking about more, uh, maybe less, less intellectualized uh, needs, uh, very primitive needs, like the, the need to feel secure and um, to feel loved. We are, I mean, all animals fear death. Certainly all animals fear it in the specific forms it incarnates in their ecologic niche. So the rabbit fears the flapping of the hawk's wings and um, <clears throat> the deer fears the snapping of twigs, which has the particular sonic signature of an approaching wolf. That's fear of death. And uh, humans fear death in those very specific forms, but also um, partly through the power of language, fear death in this sort of abstracted way, fear death, capital D death. We have this word which signifies all the forms it can take and we fear that thing and we become hyper aware of that thing. You know, we go through our first depressive episode at the age of 13 or 17 and start wearing black and uh, listening to music that scares our parents because we uh, we become aware that we've been lied to. Disney films have sort of been, well, I guess Disney films try to, try to teach you the lesson of life and death too, the circle of life and all that. But uh, um, the happy, the happy um, gospel of childhood is um, interrupted by the keen awareness the child has that I'm going to die in my Parents will die. Everyone will die. Suddenly you're looking at the world with, um, through these tinted, dark tinted lenses. You painted it all black. And we can imagine that humanity at some point had this sort of adolescent eruption of aware, awareness of mortality. Again, maybe it was 40,000 years ago. Maybe it was 500,000 years ago. Maybe it was 2.3 million years ago. Maybe it's 16,000 years ago. Uh, probably more than 16,000 years ago. I think we have <clears throat> um, burial sites of humans, which uh, I think are usually interpreted by anthropologists to indicate awareness of death and, and humans, uh, you know, are burying their loved ones as a way of making mortality palatable. It's a religious uh, ritual, which usually carries with it belief in some kind of afterlife. So a huge portion of religion is about the final things is about where we go when we die. And it's about getting right with reality and those who control reality, what we call the gods, in order to deal with the problem of life, which is death. And uh, we hate this idea so much that we are going to die, that this, that 
everything that is of value, which we call life, ends and we're taken out of it. We can't stand that idea. So religion arises as this security um, crutch. It's this system of belief which, and system of ritual which gets us to believe something which is hard to believe. I mean, it's hard to believe. <laughs> you're never going to, someone just told you, hey, you're never going to die. Don't worry. We say, yeah, okay, buddy. Thanks. Nice idea. Nice thought. But um, um, I, th I think I'm going to stick with the realistic belief that I'm going to die and everyone around me is going to die. Uh, religion has a, this, this evolved, half consciously evolved system of ritual and song and social pressures that get us to believe this thing, which is very hard to believe that will live forever, uh, that there are gods and they love us, and so on, gets us to believe these things for our own good, for our own emotional good. Anxieties regarding the difficulties of life. The, I, I used to see a bumper sticker, I think back in the 80s, it was very popular, it said, uh, life sucks and then you die. Well, here we got it. You die. And while you're alive, life kind of sucks. Um, nothing comes without a cost. Whatever you got that's good, it's already degrading by the time you got it. And the person beside you wants it. So now you got this good thing. And because it's good, you've got anxiety about somebody else trying to take it. So life sucks and it's deep built in the very structure of its goods are anxieties about those goods this is i mean buddhism maybe more clearly than any religion is just it's, it's a direct confrontation of one man with this the, the first noble truth of buddhism is life is suffering life is dukkha or uh, unsatisfying because of the anxieties built into all of its goods, even the good things, the young Siddhartha Gautama discovered, the good things of palace life, of his protected existence. He realized when he left his palace, like the adolescent realizing he will die, realized that uh, all these good things have a cost or an end or an expiry date. And uh, Buddhism offers an answer. Of course, if Buddhism just had one noble truth, it wouldn't be a religion. It would just be a depressing bumper sticker. Life is suffering. But uh, Buddhism has three other noble truths, and the fourth one is the promise of a way out of the suffering of life, indeed of life itself, through the eightfold path, right living, right thinking, right uh, concentration, right, the five other rights. Do things the right way, and we'll get you out of here, or we'll get you to the right place beyond this place. So religion uh, arises in response to the hard things in life and then offers us a uh, way out. Okay. Here are Boyer's objections to scenario two, emotivist scenarios. First of all, religion often creates as much anxiety as it creates comfort. Interesting. So uh, religion just doubles your anxieties. In fact, um, you, you thought life was hard. Oh, well, now you got to worry about hell. Uh, at least life has a, um, an end, an end date. As hard as life might be, you know it's going to end. And that can actually be a source of great comfort to a lot of us. So this too shall pass. But religion opens up a whole other world, often an infinite world, like the infinite eternal afterlife of the of Christianity and Islam. And there's great risk now, suddenly. Now you've got to worry about not just death, but about dying and going down the wrong tunnel because of the way you lived and ending up somewhere very, very bad, infinitely worse than anything you've encountered in the world forever. Wow. Is that a comforting idea? Is that a comforting idea? Well, you might say against Boyer here, uh, well, you know, you usually believe, if you're a Christian, you usually believe that other people are going to hell. <laughs> Maybe that's a cynical definition of a Christian. A Christian is someone who believes that other people are going to hell. And a Muslim is someone who believes that everyone else should be Muslim. Everyone else should be doing what they're doing because they're going to the right place. They're going to paradise. Um, 
And Boyer gives the the the, the uh, African tribal example of the Fang witches. The, this uh, was this a group that he had he had spent some time with, or was this uh, him citing another anthropologist? Um, but um, among the Fang people, is this in Cameroon? He, uh, these these translated as witches populate the religious ecosystem, and a lot of their religious activity, a lot of their propitiation um, and ritual is is uh, oriented to getting them in the right relation with these witches. These witches are um, spirit beings who populate um, the the world around the village and environs, and and who can be called upon to help or to hurt to help you or to hurt your enemies. And okay, witches are good if you've got one working for you, but they're bad if your neighbor has one working against you. So now you gotta worry not just about your neighbor, Bob, who uh, has been eyeing your, um, your um, woman, but you've got to worry about Bob's witches he might have working against you too. And Bob might hit you on the head, but the witches can do who knows what. I mean, the witches' powers are much maybe more um, undefined and therefore more frightening. So uh, uh, religion creates anxiety. But can you say, um, again, against this first objection, well, uh, Religion gives you a system of control, at least at least gives you the sense that there's something you can do about it. Something you can do about it. These things which without religious belief, we think we have just no control over at all, like the rain. We now feel we have some control over. Um, you know, you can call on the, call on Indra to make it rain. And um, that would be enough to get it going. But maybe, uh, maybe like everything in life, religion sucks too. Religion is something that happens in life, partly to deal with the problems of life. And life sucks. And so religion is going to suck too. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come with a cost, like everything good. It serves a purpose. It helps us control, or at least think we control the rain. But then it comes with this cost. We've now got to worry about whether Indra is angry with us and is going to actually intentionally cause drought because we didn't pray to him for rain in the right way. I know I'm, I'm um, slightly uh, <clears throat> um, cartoonifying um, Hinduism. And I'm not even sure if Indra is the one you'd pray to for rain. He's, he's got a lot of control over the weather, but uh, anyway. <clears throat> So uh, again, against Boyer, remember, we're just trying to explain how religion happened in human history. And we can say, look, yes, religion creates anxieties, but the fact that it initially gives us a feeling of control over the world would be enough to get it started. And then like everything, it comes with a cost. And then religion becomes more and more complex in an attempt to deal with the uh, you know, often rolling out of control costs of that religious view. Mickey Mouse and the and the magic brooms and Fantasia. Religious beliefs offer comfort only insofar as they are believed. How is it that they come to be believed in the first place? So, yeah, they they be uh, they give you comfort, but you have to believe them. Remember, um, even if religion is good news, it's only good news. It only feels like good news if you can believe it. I think we've got a pretty good response to uh, to Pascal Boyer here. We can just say, well, it, it, humans will believe things if they make them feel good. So we're not just truth-seeking, computational intelligences. We we our our beliefs are influenced by many factors, including just the fact that the belief makes us feel good. I mean, it's we should all reflect and. Uh, now and then in life, recalibrate the system and ask, you know, how much of my worldview is, is the result of wishful thinking and how much of my worldview is the result of just sensitivity to reality? How far off course have I gone? And all of us, all of us, no matter how careful you try to be, have a map which is colored by 
desire and what we want to be true and what we want to notice and not not notice uh so this this the power of wishful thinking might be enough to get us to believe in the first place i think we can say that to boyer and then thinking like an evolutionist which is the way boyer often thinks religion is a is, is a progressive series or complex of adaptations whose function is to get us to believe this thing which is quite hard to believe it which is so counter counter reality like heaven believing in heaven or believing in a super dad uh, these things are hard to believe in if we're just gonna uh, maybe stick to what we can observe uh, with our five senses and then so re religion isn't just a series of beliefs about super dad religion is maybe more than that it's it's a complex of rituals and behaviors and songs religion is the songs we sing in church or the uh, the sound of the recitation of the quran and it's it's music to our ears it's it's a pleasurable powerful numinous sound and the rituals have a numinous power to them why well to get us to believe something that facts alone won't get us to believe in make something beautiful enough i mean every ad agency knows this make things look good or sound good and people will believe in them and religion has been making these beliefs look and sound good for thousands of years okay okay enough said about that maybe just as a final wrap-up point here and i don't want to confuse you about the, the two pascals in our course but uh, the first pascal blaise pascal the french mathematician who formulated the wager actually dealt with this objection in his own way in the wager uh, he he talks about he imagines someone who's been convinced by the wager been convinced that yeah it's in my best interest to believe in god that's the best bet just out of practical interest alone and then the person says to pascal okay buddy but how am i going to actually believe this thing yeah i can see it would be nice if i believed in god i would be happier and i would have a greater chance of attaining this possible infinite happiness which maybe awaits us awaits believers in the afterlife but how do i how do i believe that i mean if i told you if i told you right now that 10 million euros will be transferred to your bank account this sunday at 1 p.m eastern standard time are you suddenly happy ecstatic that your life is going to change on Sunday at 1 p.m.? No, because you don't believe me. <laughs> your response to me would be, that would be nice. You're not happier. In fact, you're made a little bit depressed. You're reminded of the fact that you only have uh, $46.07 in your bank account. And and uh, But if I could get you to believe it, you'd be very happy, right? And so Pascal's response is, well, don't worry if you don't believe right now. If you, if you at least accept my wager, you accept that it would be better for you to believe. Uh, don't worry. Just um, start going to church. Start saying your Hail Marys and pulling beads. And uh, stop hanging around those skeptical, free-thinking friends of yours. Stop reading Sam Harris and Bertrand Russell and uh, Richard Dawkins and get off reddit slash atheist discussion forums and come back to me in 10 years pascal blaise pascal knows that religion is a intricately ingeniously designed system of ritual and song which will get you a non-believer to believe even without evidence Hey, the problem of no best world. 
Now, we've seen this uh, locution before, the problem of X, when we talked about the problem of evil. And in this case, too, it's a problem for believers in God. Here, too, there's a um, thesis which... Uh, seems to be inconsistent with uh, the thesis that a perfectly good and powerful unsurpassable being exists god from these selects the best. So imagine you're God and you were observing prior to the uh, creation of the universe. You're kind of on your little divine AutoCAD computer considering the possible worlds you could actualize. These are all like universe blueprints, okay, star maps. And uh, we've got P1 just off screen. You've been side scrolling to PW2, possible world two, possible world three, and so on, where N assumedly is for infinity. Um, uh, there's an infinity of possible worlds that God could actualize, but assumedly God being the best, demands the best, creates only best and so selects the best that is on that divine autocad computer prior to the universe in the great void god hits enter to render that universe which god correctly decides is the best among all the possible worlds so this is a very natural way to sort of schematize how a perfect being would create right from among all the possible worlds by world here remember we mean total cosmos from all of the possible cosmoses god chooses the best <clears throat> now there's this idea uh going back to at least aquinas that there really is no best world in principle in sort of conceptual space there's there's no best among all the possibilities there's an infinite hierarchy of increasingly better worlds that whatever world n you're considering in, in, in possibility space, we can always conceive of a world that's a little bit better than that one. You know, you think, think of Guanalo's perfect island. Um, you might, you might, think that whatever it is that makes an island good we can always make it better by just adding a little more of that property that that is good making in islands so if it's coconuts um, or if it's shoreline we can always add more of that and make make the world a little bit better so whichever island you're thinking of there's there's a way to think it one better mm -hmm. um, if only by expanding real estate even if you imagine a perfectly sort of harmonized um, equilibrium of a cosmos um, where all beings are uh, perfectly balanced in their relations and so there's a kind of stasis of perfection there we could say well whatever is good in that arrangement why not just expand the real estate of that universe make it a little bit bigger well maintaining the perfect balance and therefore you increase the value 
of the world. So this is this is the no best world thesis. It's debatable, of course, but if if um, if we accept this this thesis, NBW we'll call it no best world. We may have a a, a problem if we are uh, believers in in God. This thesis of no best world may be incompatible logically inconsistent with the proposition that God exists, similar to how the observation that there's evil or imperfection in, in our very world is inconsistent with the uh, belief that there's a perfect creator of that world. So there's definitely a strong continuity between the classical problem of evil, I mean, especially the deductive problem of evil, And, and this problem of no best world, you could almost think of this, this newer problem um, as, as a species of the problem of evil, though Professor Clay, Cray in our assigned reading points out some important differences. But um, anyway, let's, let's really get clear on what the problem for theism is here. Okay, so we have here four propositions, NBW, which we just talked about, P1, P2, Proposition 1, Proposition 2, and then G, the G belief. The G belief is just the belief that there's a God, actually even milder, there possibly exists a being who is essentially unsurpassable, da 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 da. So there's possibly a, a God. It's the very, you call this, um, sort of uh, the possibility of theism, okay. NBW is just the belief that um, there's no best world. This is the belief going back to Aquinas that we just uh, talked about. It's stated here a little more technically or precisely. I'll let you uh, read through that. The focus of the discussion, <clears throat> um, certainly in Professor Cray's able summary, of this 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 problem uh, is on on propositions one and two, which we'll turn to in just a moment. But before we sort of zoom in on what P1 and P2 are asserting, I just want you to see that the problem of no best world for theism can sort of logically be discerned by considering the relationship among these four propositions. Specifically, we can put it like this. If these three are true, okay, if these first three are true, then the fourth one is false. Okay, that's, that's the problem of no best world. If we want to put it sort of most polemically at theism, these four propositions can't all be true. They form a logically inconsistent set. And so one of them has to go. One of them's got to go. And if you're on board with NBW and you think P1's plausible and P2 is plausible, G's got a problem. And maybe G is the one that's got to go, okay? And of course, G is the view that there possibly exists a God. If G is false, that means it's not possible that there exists a God. In other words, God is impossible, <laughs> which is, which is notice, logically a much bolder claim than the view there's not a God. It's one thing to say there's no God. It's another thing to say God is impossible, right? I mean, that's true of anything. It's one thing to say, um, you know, the Raptors won't win this year. And it's another thing to say it's impossible for the Raptors to win. Okay, well, what, what are P1 and P2 
telling us? Well, P1 and P2 are, are connected and they're, they're both seemingly sensible, quite sensible, uh, basic claims about the relationship between actors and their actions and the product of those actions. Okay, so an actor is the one who does, an action is the doing, and the product is what is done by the action of the actor. Okay, and P1 simply says, if it's possible for the product of an action to have been better, then Keter's paribus, you can look that up, it just means all else equal. It's possible for that action to have been better. Okay. Again, a very sensible claim. Think of uh, 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 an artist and the act of painting and the product of the act of painting, which we'll call the, well, I guess we can call it the painting <laughs> confusedly. Let's call it the, uh, the portrait. Oh boy, now that makes it too specific because we want to want to let some landscapes and an abstract art in here too, depending on the artist's taste. Well, um, we'll call it the painting and hopefully be able to distinguish here. Okay, if it's possible for the the painting itself, the canvas and the paint on it to have been better, that means it's possible for the the act of painting to have been better, right? <laughs> if if I'm in the studio all day, and at the end of my my day, I've got I unveil to you uh, my my finished work of art, and we agree that the work of art, let's say it's a still life of a bowl of fruit. Um, if we agree that my banana is a little bit off and. Uh, Really, I could have arranged the fruit bowl a little more pleasingly, with more seasonal variety. And so in the end, the painting just isn't, isn't as good as it could have been. Well, it, it just sort of doesn't it logically follow from that insight that therefore my action as a painter could have been better. So as I said, P1 is just, it's, it's almost just a logical explication of the relationship between these, these concepts between the concept of a product and an action and an actor, really the actor comes to the forefront in P2. So P2 just says, look, if it's possible for the action to have been better, for the painterly uh, motions of, of the paintbrush upon the canvas, if it's possible for those actions to have been better, then all else being equal, it's possible for the actor to have been better, right? If, if, if my, act of painting could have been better than I could have been better. No. I am, um, you could say the sum of my actions, or I don't think we need to assert that. We could just say, um, you know, my actions are evidence of my own qualities. And if my actions are falling short, that means I, and falling short. Okay. So if P1 and P2 sound reasonable to you and you accept this idea that for any world you can imagine, you can always imagine it being a little bit better or a lot better. Well, then you've got a problem for G. And, and to see that, and here's really, <laughs> now we're finally, I guess everything so far has been just uh, leading up to this punchline. Here we get really the argument itself of, of no best world, the atheistic argument. So God is impossible is the conclusion of this atheistic argument. Why? Well, for any world that God creates, there could have been a better one, okay? NBW tells you that. 
And if there could have been a better one, in other words, if the product of the creating could have been better, then the action could have been better, then the creating could have been better. And if the creating could have been better, then the creator could have been better. The creator here being capital C, creator, capital G, God. Okay? So that is the problem of no best world for theism. It's an atheistic argument, which concludes that God is impossible, or not G. We negate G by asserting these three. We assert these three and say, therefore, not G. God, impossible. Okay. So now we ask, how might the theist, the believer, respond to this novel analytic problem? Well, we could reject no best world. So that's the, remember we have those four propositions. The first three, if true, lead to the negation of the fourth. And so the, the theist, I mean, it would seem the theist has just got to figure out a way to reject one of those first three propositions. Well, what about the first one? The first one, uh, if you look at the last slide, was no best world itself, the, the view that there's no best possible world. Um, and, you know, there, 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 there's certainly a, you know, interminable discussion to be had there. But uh, Klaus Cray points out in, in, in the associated reading that if you reject as a theist, as a believer, if you reject the no best world thesis, we've got the problem of evil. Okay. We've got a problem with God's freedom and we have a problem which we can call modal collapse. Now these problems um, m maybe can be dealt with one in one, but the point is, if you're a believer in God and you also want to reject the no best world thesis, that, that means you're, you're, you're asserting that the world we're actually in is the best possible world. Okay. And you've got to wrestle with the problem of evil then. No, maybe you can wrestle with that successfully. Um, but there's also a problem with God's freedom here. Problem four the belief that God acts freely. I mean, it's really definitional of a person, that the person has freedom in their action, you know, and um, God is a super person, so should be super free. And it's funny, if, if, you, if you imagine that there really is, you know, on that great AutoCAD collection of all the renderings of possible worlds if, if if you really reject nbw you're saying there is one blueprint there of a cosmos which is is the best and which then god has to create right so then if you reject no best world you're really saying that god had to create exactly this world and really lacked the freedom to create any competing world um, I, I don't know if, if I'm convinced this is such a problem. I mean, uh, my own, my own response to this, this challenge to God's freedom is to say, well, God is, God is moral and God is a supreme artist. And so God does what is best. And it's, it strikes me as strange to say, therefore God, because God sort of has to do the best, <laughs> God, um, isn't free when God does the best. I think another way of describing what's going on when God creates the best possible world is just to say, well, God could have, I guess, could have created um, a worse world, but that would be, a, you know, a worse thing to do. And that wouldn't be very godly then. And I guess, strictly speaking, it wouldn't be a God who would do that. But it, you know, if, and if you want to, if you want to say that, therefore, God isn't quite free in um, demanding the best and always doing the best, 
that in other words, God's standards are so exacting um, and God um, is absolutely consistent. God would never deviate from those supreme standards. If you, if you want to say that, that strictness in God's moral and aesthetic uh, action means God isn't free. I, I, you know, okay. I, I guess then freedom to me, um, is perhaps not, not a supreme quality. You know, the, the important thing is to do the best. <laughs> and if you're so single-minded like God is on doing the best that practically speaking, you're never going to deviate from that. Um, I guess you could consider that a kind of constraint, but you know, I mean, when, I mean, God also does math correctly, you know, God, God will never say two plus three equals six, except as a joke. Um, God, God must output on the right side of the equal sign, the correct answer. Uh, God is a supreme, supreme mathematician. So God never, uh, gives the wrong answer. Do we want to say that therefore God isn't free, you know, as a mathematician? Well, I guess you could say that, but um, I'm not sure this is a terrible problem. The problem of modal collapse is interesting. Um, modal here is, is uh, Im implying modal logic. If you, if you, if you study logic, you'll see one subset of, of the discipline of logic. It concerns what's called modal logic. And modal logic is the logic of possibility and necessity. I think that's a okay definition of it for our purposes, I think. And um, so modal collapse <laughs> is a really, I, I, I think, a catchy term for the idea that if this world is the best possible world and therefore the one that God had to create, then the world becomes necessary, right? If God is a necessary perfect being um, and there's a best possible world, then God has to create that world. And then it's not just, it's not just God's freedom that is threatened then by NBW, it's that every event in this world is necessary, you know, and it's necessity comes not from the usual way. Usually when we talk about the necessity of a particular event in our world, we're concerned about say causal necessity where we're worried that the prior events in the chain links of uh, cause and effect and cause and effect that the prior events have sort of say physically necessitated the event, you know, um, in modal collapse, we're saying the very conditions of creation, the very the, this basic logical fact that the world created had to be created, that particular world with everything exactly in it had to be created. Um, then nothing in this world is free, including us. So the problem of modal collapse is the problem that this entire world and everything in it becomes Necessit necessitated, um, it loses any quality of freedom we might have thought it had. So uh, I guess you could bite the bullet here if you're a theist and you could say, okay, there's no such thing as freedom, then uh, neither in God's creating this particular world nor among any of the creatures um, that would, would, as I say, be biting the bullet and maybe too great a concession. So remember, if you're a theist and you want to uh, defend the fourth proposition of our original four, that God is possible, you could grant NBW and then show that G, remember G, G is not the belief that God exists. G is the milder belief that God is possible. And you might just show that, that that very mild belief that God is possible is really preferable to P1 and P2. 
that uh, you know as plausible as p1 and p2 are they are um, um, making sort of confident can i call them factual factual logical assertions about the relationship between um, the actor and the actine and the product of the act and you've got those three elements among p1 and p2 um, and the logical relations asserted between those three elements and so you could say uh, there's, there's a lot there that could go wrong in, in 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 mapping out the relationships between these three things and moreover in p1 and p2 we're, we're making this kind of bold claim that there's this uh, you know very strict necessary relationship between the three uh, elements of, of actor and act and and product and comparably g just just asserts that something is is possible that god is just possible <clears throat> you know in in general if you if you have two uh competing worldviews and the first worldview says um, rain is possible and the second one says earthquakes are necessary <laughs> um, now maybe I've unfairly stacked stacked the details and the examples there but uh, you, you get my point uh, to the second claim about earthquakes is a lot bolder not just because it's talking about something specific and a little bit unusual relative to rain but uh, more to our purposes because it's it's making this sort of um, um, claim of necessity whereas the claim about rain was just that it's possible it's not we're not saying that it's going to rain today or tomorrow or even ever <laughs> we're just saying that it, it it rain is always a possibility you know so that's because it's a milder assertion the one about rain it's more plausible uh, you might think on on the, now that's not an absolute rule right i mean there's some possibility claims which we can show are um flat out false i mean if i say it's possible that two plus three equals seven i i, I think you should you should be willing to say no that's that's not possible that's impossible by the very meaning of the the terms you've just employed <clears throat> but anyway this is uh, this is again another way that the theist the second way that the theist could push back at the problem we're considering here today Now this third one we're not going to spend time on really, but notice that I, I you could really bite the bullet as a theist and say as a theist and say well I, I'll just deny G I'll deny that um, um, specifically this this view that God is unsurpassable so you could you could in other words adjust your definition of God and say that that adjusted god is possible because it's it's god's unsurpassability that really you know feeds this this problem of no best world it's because god's supposed to be the best unsurpassably best that uh, the fact that there's always some better world we can imagine um, seems, seems contradictory so anyway this i think a lot of believers would say this is really atheism i mean if you're denying unsurpassability you're really denying the absolutely perfect being i mean by definition absolute really unsurpassable is if you had to give one word to define god the absolutely perfect being unsurpassable is a pretty good word to choose absolutely perfect means unsurpassable so let's pass this one Okay, the fourth option is to attack either P1 or P2. Remember, one of those four uh, original propositions has to go, and if you can show that it's P1 or P2, then uh, you can hang on to G, right? The belief in the possible God.
So we'll talk a bit about um, uh, one particular problem with P1 raised by philosopher Brian Leftow. And just to remind you, this is just a copy paste from a prior slide. P1 just, just again says that if the product can be better, then the action can be better. If the world isn't as good as it could be, then the creation, the act, um, isn't as good as it could have been, right? And um, Leftow points out that the product here is, we're talking about the cosmos, and it's really a composite result of God's contributions as the creator, but also the actions of the creature's within the world, right? Cosmos, when we're talking about which cosmos is best, we're talking about the sum total of each cosmos, the totality of all events that transpire throughout the, the total history of that cosmos. Think sort of of that four dimensional block universe conception. And that includes all of the creaturely actions throughout the history of that cosmos. So yes, we're c comparing worlds, but the, the, the product, the end product of a world means truly the, the end, what emerges by the end of it, the total history. So when, uh, when we're comparing the value of different universes, we're comparing um, contributions from God and, and the creature, okay? So Leftow is, is, is saying that, well, actually, it is possible for the, the world to have been better, but that doesn't mean that um, God's action could have been any better. Maybe God did everything God could possibly do to set up a sort of field of play in the universe to create the sort of garden, if we want to use the Edenic metaphor. And then Adam and Eve are let loose in the garden. And when we're, you know, when we ask, well, what was the what was the final total value of the garden or the cosmos? We're talking about both the garden and what Adam and Eve do in it. And so um, we're we're kind of getting off, getting God off the hook here, similar to the way we'd get God off the hook in the problem of evil, by uh, pointing out that evils may be the, the the result of of creaturely free action right um, now professor cray i think i think rightly points out that if if we're going to be consistent then if by by product here we mean the combined results of divine and creaturely action then then by action we should mean both divine and creaturely considered as sort of a set of total actions um, so uh, Cray points out in the reading that strictly speaking left out hasn't overthrown p1 right in other words, we should we should if, if we want to take into account creaturely contribution, then we we got to be consistent. We should say if it's possible for the product to have been better, then it's possible for the action to have been better, and we've got to decide before we assert P one. We've got to decide: are we talking about just God, or are we talking about God plus creatures? If we're going to talk about just God, then by product divine product, we just mean the world insofar as God set it up. And then it still holds that if, if that initial setup could have been better, then it's possible for the action to have been better. So, so if we're trying to overthrow P1 by pointing out, by re reminding thinkers of the uh, contribution of creatures, uh, we've, we've failed. The spirit of Leftow's criticism, though, is is very much in line with the spirit of the free will defense of, of, of theism that uh, we see in the discussion of problem of evil. 
And the spirit of the um, response here, uh, of the defense here, is that, uh, God, you know, God might do everything God can to set up um, set up a, a, a perfect world, but inevitably the creatures will um, will make it less than perfect. Um, I guess um, there's a missing premise here that the best kinds of worlds will be worlds in which creatures are behaving freely. That is, if we're considering all the possible worlds that we might create, we should just rule out right away those worlds in which there's no no freedom, right? We're going to focus as the creator before we create. We're going to zoom in on that subset of possible worlds where free creatures are operating. And then we're going to select among those worlds the best. We're going to try to create, in other words, the best garden in which creatures can move and behave and choose. Um, okay, but I, I think then the, the, the problem is, is just then, well, among all those possible garden setups, surely uh, we can ask, well, why, why, which for, for any given one, why can't you just imagine a slightly better one? Whatever it is that makes the setup good before you throw the creatures in. Um, we can imagine that setup being a little bit better, right? Uh, so it seems like both in the strict technical sense that Cray points out, Leftow's criticism does not overturn P1. And then if we take, as I've just done, Leftow's criticism in the, in the spirit of the free will defense analogy, we've just, uh, focus the original problem of no best world now to this subset of of uh, of arenas. You know, God creates the arena. We're the players. Okay, fine. So let's just focus on God's contribution, which is the arena construction. Well, for any given arena you conceive of, can't we just imagine a, a better arena, a bigger arena with more room for more players? Whatever. We've just got, you know, a, a narrower version, but still the same problem uh, that we started with, which is uh, um, could have been better.